I'm really happy to, to welcome you at V2. Um, I'll first uh, introduce myself. My name is Anne Nichten. I'm uh, the manager of the V2 lab. And I'm one of your moderators today. Your other moderator is Susan Lee, who I will introduce in a minute. And together with my team and the virtual platform, we're responsible for the flashing out event. And as you may have noticed, the flashing out uh, event comprises two days, a seminar and a workshop. So the seminar takes place today, as you might have noticed, uh, here at V2, and is part of the V2 test lab series. We organize the test labs as new events to include the audience and inform them about uh, our fields of interest in innovative artistic research and development uh, trajectories. And uh, the second day will be organized tomorrow by the virtual platform that is for invited guests only, so if you're uh, among the lucky ones, you can participate there. And they organize a scenario workshop in Amsterdam. And uh, I would like to mention our um, thanks to um, the Mondrian Foundation and the Section Universities uh, who've uh, supported uh, the event financially. And the, later on, I come to uh, the program. Um, I first want to in kind of get you in the right mood for the flashing out event. As we uh, set out quite an ambitious program, we, informed, uh, we aim to inform you about what we consider state-of-the-art developments in the field of material research. And we hope to critically investigate uh, the, the role of artists and uh, what new uh, material research and innovative technologies mean for artists, how they deal with it, as uh, we consider it uh, also a task or an aim of a lot of uh, designers and artists and technologists to, to co-design what we can do, what we want to do with technologies. And it's, uh, I think, also a good op opportunity to include a critical view on recent developments in art design and technology. Um, I think uh, I spoke enough now. Um, we are happy to present an excellent line up, up of speakers. Um, they represent a range of fields, so that's from fashion, other fields of design, art, uh, industry, social sciences. So I think this is actually a splendid lineup for all of us to really get a grip on what's happening, but also to actively participate in uh, the debate in the end of uh, this day. You see the already some setup um, parts in uh, there over there, and that's part of the demonstrations uh, this afternoon. And we hope you actively participate and try to figure. Sometimes it's also possible to try things on and uh, play with the new uh, pieces being presented here today. Um, I just want to go very briefly to the program. Um, we have um, two uh, parts in our program. Um, it's two types of presentations, uh, the talks and demonstrations. So we start with Susan Lee, uh, followed by Anne Galloway and Toby Carriage. Then we have uh, a lunch break, and we aim to connect theory with practice, because I think that's something what we at V2 really try to uh, to make a kind of point where people from practice theory and all kinds of different fields come together, not only in lectures, but also to try out things, to show things, to demonstrate and discuss things. So the second part, uh, after the lunch break, 
is uh, the demonstration session. And we will ask some people to free some seats over there, this kind of part of uh, the room, so people can also walk over to the demonstrations. Uh, the following people will give a demonstration. That's uh, Tekla Schiphorst, Joanna Berzovska, Christina Anderson, and Susan Lee. And then the, the second uh, presentation talk uh, session is um, done by Gert Brinks, Jonat Zur, and we close the day with a debate uh, led by Susan and myself. But please, if you have questions during uh, the, the presentations, the talks or the demonstrations, please take a note because we have a very tight program, but I really would uh, like you to actively participate in the debate uh, on in the final session. So, we move to Susan. Um, our first speaker, and I'm really happy to um, announce her, is Susan Lee. Susan is Senior Research Fellow in Fashion at Central St. Martin's College of Art and Design at the University of the Arts London. And her, her book, I have a copy here. That, that's this one. Can you prepare uh, Susan's presentation while I talk? Okay. Um, she actually, she mentioned that there's two very, very cheap copies available for students. So the students uh, should pay attention and try to grab her in the lunch break. Um, her book, Fashioning the Future, Tomorrow's Wardrobe, imagines a future wardrobe based on trends in contemporary R&D. Susan has exhibited her own work internationally and has worked as a fashion curator for the British Council. And she's also a creative consultant for several London-based fashion designers. Later today, Susan will also demonstrate her current research uh, project Bio Couture. Susan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Are you okay? I think so, if okay. this is working. Is that all right? Can you hear me okay? Thank you very much to the um, V2 organizers for inviting me. Um, it looks like it's going to be a really exciting couple of days. Um, as Anna said, the talk I'm giving this morning is based on the research that I did for my book. Um, and this was looking very much at the future of fashion, but not what we usually think of as what's happening next season or in the next couple of years, but 5, 10, 50, even beyond to 100 years from now. So shifts that take a great deal longer to actually permeate and become mainstream. Um, because there's so much going on in the research world, which is exciting, it's always very difficult to know what to choose uh, to compress into a talk like this, which is quite short. Um, so I've had to kind of pick and choose. Hopefully, um, it's going to be interesting. My actual background being fashion tends towards products or projects which um, may in some way have reference to what people will be wearing in their daily lives. So you m I won't cover so much of the sort of art performance type work, but I think there'll be other artists here today who are going to be talking in more depth about that kind of thing. So before we kind of leap into the future, I think it's quite useful to look back at the recent past and, in fact, um, to go back to the Italian futurists. Because in 1914, um, Giacomo Balla drafted a manifesto for, for men's dress. And in it, they stated various objectives that might be desirable for clothing in the future. And amongst the list of things, they mentioned that futurist clothing might be dynamic and responsive, that it might be joyful and illuminate in the rain, that it might be perhaps temporary or disposable, that it could have changeable characteristics, be phosphorescent and lit by electric lamps. They suggested that patterns might change according to your mood and that you might have modifications that were loving or perfumed. And that was a vision from nearly a century ago that I think is probably quite familiar to a lot of researchers today. 
because most of those ideas that were thought up by the futurists have now either been achieved or are certainly being worked on in research labs all around the world. In terms of where the research is happening, I think that it's quite interesting that for the most part, it's not happening in fashion and textile departments. Um, if you go back to the 1960s, fashion designers were leading the way in terms of where clothing was going. Designers like Pierre Cardin and Paco Rabanne, André Courage, and this is Rudy Gernreich, they were all very happy to go and talk to scientists and worked in collaboration with chemists to develop new materials and investigate new ways of creating clothing. But in that inter, uh, the period since the 60s, fashion's kind of moved into this retro recycling sort of system where it really has been uh, sportswear that has fed innovation uh, into fashion. Um, but at the same time, in research environments all around the world, uh, you have whole spectrums of art, design, science coming together and working on developments that could potentially radically alter how people dress in the future. So some of these are possibly radical in terms of how we currently dress, but I think that it's exciting to think about what the new possibilities might be for the 21st century. Obviously, one of the most talked about areas for clothing is e-textiles or electronics um, being integrated and embedded into cloth. Um, we've seen in recent years electronics engineers coming together with textile designers and artists, weavers and knitters collaborating to use conductive yarns and fibers uh, to embroider, to weave, to knit and to print electronic components. And there's a whole range of soft electronic tools now that can be used in textiles, such as switches and wiring, um, stretch sensors, keyboards, and even woven radio antenna. So that means that clothing can become an interface and a hub as well as a display. Um, you may be familiar with the products that are already in the market. High-end snowwear brands like Burton, O'Neill, Spider are all combining a, a sort of textile um, hybrid clothing that has a textile interface to a pocketed uh, mp3 player or a mobile phone and that kind of makes a lot of sense in terms of bringing the two technologies together because we're talking about a really technical garment it's made from technical textiles it's a premium price sometimes hundreds thousands of, of pounds or euros um, so it's a high-spec garment. And if you imagine that you're snowboarding and you've got bulky gloves on, it's really difficult to put your hand inside your pocket to get your phone or to change a track on, a, on, an, on an MP3 player. So having an interface on the exterior of a garment sort of makes sense. But I think where things slip up is when you think that you can suddenly drop technology into any kind of clothing without considering what the context is. So this is a, a key thing that I think I'm sure will come up as a theme for today, but certainly the context for how you use technology and design is really important. And products that are successful are always the result of collaboration between the best designers, engineers, scientists, and artists coming together and problem solving together. Um, and certainly for this kind of product, it's, it's a real challenge in terms of industry because you've got a fashion system clashing with an electronics giant and those two teams of developers have to come together and begin to sort of speak the same language, figure out new manufacturing protocols. This is a, another example of certainly a big future market for e-textiles, which is looking at healthware, body monitoring and sportswear. Um, so this is a, the Textronix Numetrex bra, and it's a heart-sensing sports bra. It's got e-textiles woven into, knitted into the fabric, and they actually pick up the heartbeat, uh, have a little transmitter that clips onto the front of the bra, which sends that data to a watch that then displays it so the wearer can read it. So it's, it's an application where a knitted garment sits between 
two sources of electronic technology. And obviously, once we start thinking about the body as, as a site for gathering data, then what do we do with that? Where does it go? How can we use it? Um, certainly, one issue is how we display it. And, and displays themselves have become something that we've seen kind of increasingly explored on the body. So here, the jacket from Pioneer uh, uses flexible displays, which are facilitated by organic light-emitting diodes. And these can be printed onto a very thin, flexible plastic surface and don't need much power to operate, so they're quite suitable for putting in a garment. Um, the one on the right is by uh, a company called Luna. This is quite an old concept project, but it sort of shows how different technologies link together within a garment. So they came up with the idea of a sort of A to Z jacket for a, a cycle courier. And this really used um, a jacket which could display digital information linked to um, mobile and wireless and GPS uh, technology. So, for example, a courier could use his phone to download um, a map from something like Street Map. The phone would send that to the jacket, the jacket would display it, and a wearable GPS system would track his route and then update it live as he was moving through it. The guys at Luna also thought about, well, actually, this is really nothing other than a blank canvas on which to put data. And there are so many things that you could do with that. And one, for example, commercially, might be to think of it as, as a walking billboard so that you actually become advertising. And that then possibly inverts the, the role of consumer and brand because potentially, you can imagine, rather than you paying a brand to wear their logo on your T-shirt, they pay you to buy a section of your garment to display it. And that grants them, obviously, access to perhaps a physical space that normally wouldn't allow advertising. And the garment then becomes part of the wider information environment or landscape. Uh, being conscious that e-textiles promotes connectivity, we, we're beginning to see projects where people are asking how clothing might be expressive in different ways. How might clothes respond to us, to other people, or to the actual environment itself? And maybe could it make things tangible, which aren't usually? So. Clothing has always been seen as a form of communication, but once, obviously, you can begin to show image, text, and sound with it, it, it takes it much further. And certainly, when the wearer can become involved in the creation of that information, it shifts the, the balance between the designer creating a finished product, a product and giving it to the wearer. And here, the project on the left is from France Telecom working with... Um, French fashion designer, Elizabeth de Senville. They, they had a very low res display that could be slotted into bags or slotted into garments and could be programmed on your phone. Just simple little animations or, or text messages. Um, but something that basically was interactive that was changeable in real time. So the garment becomes a device that the wearer begins to use to interact with the world around them. It's quite a crude example, that, but obviously it sort of shows where things might go. The one on the right, I think, is interesting because it's a, it's a more subliminal, softer approach um, to using display on technology. This is from fashion victims who were a group at uh, Ivrea in Italy. And this, this whole project came about from research um, looking at the electromagnetic radiation that surrounds us in the environment. So that given off by things like mobile phones, for example. And they came up with a series of clothes and accessories which had bladders of, of dye embedded in them and sensors which detected the electromagnetic radiation in the environment. And basically, as the radiation was detected, the, the, the bladder of dye began to sort of leak and as the increasing radiation levels got, became more, it would leak more and more dye. So what looks like 
um, a sort of a stain also grows and changes over time. And because it's not like a print, it sort of asks you, or it sort of invites you to ask what's happening. So it's engaging on, on a visual level, but it's actually inviting people to inquire. And so it's, it sort of serves to critique perhaps a social um, message that perhaps wouldn't normally be explored in something like a, a garment or an accessory. And I think it sort of it, it points the way to a, a sort of generation of soft electronic products that perhaps uh, interact with us in, in ways that are, are different to, to how we've done before. And interesting, quite a lot of these projects are not coming from fashion designers. These, for example, are, are interaction designers. And they're asking questions about clothing, saying, you know, how might we come together and use clothing to perhaps highlight a moment or an emotion or to reveal movement or to form connections with people. So Cute Circuit um, produced a dress that was based on a Victorian design. Um, when the wearer is just sitting still, it's all black and it's a very demure look. But as she gets up and starts to move around, the sensors underneath the skirt detect this movement and electroluminescent panels within the skirt become illuminated. And so it sort of acknowledges that she's involved in this exchange with other people. And the one on the right is from 5050. And this was a pair of jackets that have electroconductive uh, panels on the front which are uh, embroidered and appliqued. And these are linked to light emitting diodes on the back and little speakers. And basically what happens is when the two garments come together, they complete an electric circuit and suddenly they light up and they, they make a sort of acknowledgement that there's this joining together of the two people. It's actually quite basic technology used in both those projects. But I think it's interesting how they're kind of engaging with garments coming together and making connections. This one takes it one step further, this is Cute Circuit developing their own hug shirt. And I think it shows how um, people are sort of looking at, under, trying to understand e exchanging emotion remotely. Um, so for example, if I was wearing this shirt today and my partner had the same one on in London, he could squeeze his shirt and I would feel a hug on stage in front of you. This has got pressure sensors embedded in the garment that detect where, um, how hard, and when they're being touched. And then that is sent to a phone, which sends the data to another phone, which then sends it to the garment. Um, and that idea of, of how clothing begins to interact with the world around you, I think, is really kind of interesting in that clothing becomes central and key to how we move through life. Um, it might listen to our vital signs um, and send data to medical professionals. It might connect us to other, perhaps. Um, and that communicating and exchanging information with the world around us is certainly a really new idea. I'm going to sort of zip through a few different concepts if I've got time. Um, the next area, moving on from electronics, is something I wanted to include because it's one of the key produ uh, projects was taking place here in Holland. Um, it's looking at the role of 3D printing. And um, if you're not familiar with them, I mean most people have a 2D printer connected to their computer that's printing out sheets of paper. 3D printers are used in industry to prototype uh, real objects in obviously three dimensions. Um, but what was originally used as a prototyping tool is now being seen as possibly something which could actually be used to manufacture something. Um, there are two main types of manufacture, one being um, additive, whereby you lay down layers of material which are then thermally bonded either with a laser or with glue. And then there are um, reductive methods where you maybe have a tank of resin, for example, and you cut away, or starch, and you cut away to leave an object behind. Um, but what you can use is a CAD file 
to design your 3D, 3D object and then send that to the printer. And this is the work of Freedom of Creation, who are based here in Holland. And they're looking at 3D printers to fabricate textile structures and directly into garments. So this is one of their first prototypes. And the actual textile chain link structure was designed using a computer. Um, if you look at that one on the left, you can see the main chain link structure, a different chain coming off it, and their, their logo, FOC, that's all been produced in one go. And with that kind of printing, you can manufacture incredibly complex parts that you literally can't do in any other way. And if you go to their website, they've got little films showing examples of fully working zippers, for example, that moving parts within uh, another a greater part of the garment. This, this garment here was created in one go. There's no seams to that. And the whole thing compresses down into a very small space. Um, if you then take that technology and link it to something else which is already out there, which is body scanning, you have the potential to create a garment which can be completely tailored to the individual. Um, 3D scanners, certainly, I don't know about in Holland, but in London, we now have them on the high street. And you can go into a big store like Selfridges and get your body scanned. And that data can then be applied to whatever. So at the moment, it's still going through a very traditional fashion manufacturing route. But potentially, once you have your data stored, you can use that to, for example, put it into a CAD file and have a design modified to fit you exactly, and then to print out the garment or accessory. Now, these are prototypes that are just being shown here. Um, companies like Adidas use this sort of technology all the time to prototype shoes. They've just recently begun to put elastomerics into it so that you can now print something which has got some flex and stretch. They can print quite crude color, you can see there, but they have started to do that. Obviously, it's a long way from anything that really resembles fabric. So it's just the very early stages, but obviously with more development as the technology comes down in price and as the material science behind the materials improves, potentially um, it's a really exciting area to look to for the future. Already it's being used, um, there was a project at the London College of Fashion um, which was collaborating to look at the idea of producing football boots for top class players who maybe are running £50,000 a week and for whom £20,000 on a couple of shoes is a, a sort of um, justifiable expense. So what they did was they scanned each foot of a footballer um, and everybody's foot is completely different. They then designed the sole of the shoe to fit how that player's foot um, worked when he, was play when he was playing. That each shoe was completely different and designed and then printed out using a 3D printing process. And then the upper was produced using a leather upper in a very traditional way. So these kinds of hybrid products are possibly one step towards making that a reality. And if you think about that, it has huge implications for all sorts of things. You don't need to ship goods around when actually all that's being transferred is data, for example. So you can take a design from one country and just send it as a digital file and print it out somewhere else. If you're a shop, you don't need to carry stock because you only need one sample of something. If someone's come in and say, OK, well, I'd like that in my size. This is my measurements and then something is printed out there. You don't even need the shop, in fact. So it, it poses all sorts of questions for, for the future of how we produce and design things, and also recycle. And if we stay on the theme of instantly manufacturing, I've brought this one in as well because it, it's, it's looking at how design and science are coming together. And this is Manel Torres. And he trained as a fashion designer at the Royal College of Art in London. But he did his PhD um, looking at how chemistry might be used to create fabric. 
and he's now got a startup company called Fabrican, which is looking at spraying cloth onto the body. So he's looking at producing an aerosol that produces a sort of mist of cotton fiber that can go directly onto the body like a second skin that has um, elastomerics that make it stretchy. It can be colored, it can be perfumed, and you can peel it back and make it drape. And I think he's interesting because he's an example of someone who's come from a traditional design background and being frustrated with the existing options for how to use fabric and construct it, and has gone and talked to scientists and thought, well, look, here's, you know, there may be another way. And, and has really struggled in that alien environment to get to grips with the, the new languages, the knowledge and the working practices, which are so different, in fact, almost opposite to how you might work in art and design. For example, he, he was talking to me about how when he first started in the laboratory, he'd just be mixing things kind of willy-nilly and thinking, oh, that's really interesting. I like the way this is happening. And then would keep going. And then at the end of the day, think, oh, how did I do that again? And because he wasn't keeping detailed notes, he wasted huge amounts of time. And obviously in science, everything you do is really documented and it's done in small stages so you can keep track of where you went. And art is all about embracing mistake and you know, actually thinking this is, this is good. You know, how can we kind of work with that? So, so these are some of the sort of struggles that I think artists and scientists perhaps kind of hit against. And, and that embrace of chemistry leads us on to the final area, which is going to be picked up throughout today. Um, this is, going back to the earliest form of garment, this is a 19th century Inuit parka, and it's made from lots of bird skins joined together. And I think it's interesting that we started off by wearing animal skin. We learned how to harvest cotton and to spin silk and to weave wool. And then in the 20th century, we learned how to take petrochemicals and spin synthetic fibers like nylon. And at the beginning of the 21st century, we're beginning to see projects which are returning to nature in a way, except that it's using biotechnology to propose the most radical visions for the future. And an emerging area of investigation is using living organisms, such as bacteria and fungi, and animal and even human cells, to grow materials and ultimately to produce artifacts and, and maybe even products. Um, for me as a fashion designer, I think this is a really interesting area because I think it's very difficult to ignore the issues that have been coming up recently. Um, th the fact that it's not really acceptable to keep turning out more and more fabric. The textile industry itself is one of the most polluting in the world. So the environmental and ethical issues and s sustainability in fashion are really coming to the fore. And we really need to be coming up with alternatives that begin to address some of those issues. So I think it's probably the right time to start asking whether biotechnology has a place in textiles and clothing. This is, um, this is the work of Donna Franklin, who was a textile um, master's gra uh, graduate who had a residency at the Tissue Culture and Art Project. Sorry, Symbiotica. Um, thanks, Yonet. She, um, if, we look, if we look at one of the, the areas for sustainability, one of the areas of interest is fungi and bacteria, and this is what Donna was working with here. The dress is silk, but it's been sewn with a fungi which is commonly called orange bracket. And I think what's interesting about it is that as an artist, she is, she's inquiring about the role of nature, taking a part in a role in the design process. And the fungi is giving the garment, the finished piece, its color, and it's beginning to take on the structure of the garment. So the petals that you see are like the fungi forming. So it's, it's a complementary process. She's no longer in complete control of, of what's being produced. She's letting na nature take its course. This is, um, I'm going to be talking about this later on this afternoon, but this is my own project of biocouture. 
And this is looking at the idea of using bacteria to grow organic material for use in textiles and clothing. Um, this is living material whilst it's being grown, but the actual final garment is made from the dried material. And this is using a process which is actually thousands of years old. Um, we're hoping to study the material, learn from the behavior of the bacteria, and hopefully modify it in such a way as to develop a material which becomes viable for textiles. Um, I've got a sample with me which I'll show this afternoon, and it's a long way from being wearable, but I think it's, it's really exciting because it brings into mind the idea that a future garment factory might be very unfamiliar to those of us now, in that instead of rolls of cloth and sewing machines, it's possible to imagine a laboratory environment where you have vats of material which are growing over body forms. And that's where uh, I think uh, Oren, um, Yonad and Oren's pro uh, project comes into play very much so. Um, Yonat's going to be talking about this this afternoon, but her work on, with Symbiotica on victimless leather is really radical in its approach and thinking. And it's exploring the idea of the living garment. I don't want to say too much about this because she's going to go into it this afternoon. But if you think about growing, how we use animals to, to, to eat and also for their skin, and how we culture human skin for treating burns victims, for example. There is a question there which is raised, which is rather than an animal having to die for its skin, what if we could culture it? Another project which is going to be talked about later is Toby Kerridge, who worked with collaboration with Nikki Stott and Ian Thompson. And they worked with scientists in a tissue engineering department. And this explored biotechnology for using the human body to create um, human bone that could be cultured into jewelry. Um, I'm not going to go further into that now. But again, fundamentally, what it's proposing is that biotechnology could possibly become a legitimate process for artistic inquiry, but also possibly for the creation of some sort of new product and raw materials. So what I've shown here is a really quick kind of introduction, in a way, to some of the really tentative footsteps that so many people are exploring in many parts of um, art, design, and science and technology. And they, they kind of give a glimpse into the future design worlds that we're just beginning to kind of imagine. Um, I've missed out some key things. One I'm very conscious of is uh, shape memory materials, but I know that Joey is going to be talking a lot about that later. I think it's kind of important to, to look again at the context of where this fits as well, because it may be that some of these technologies really don't come to anything. You know, the, the role of research is to, to experiment and to ask questions. Um, and sometimes when you speak to uh, people from traditional disciplines, there's a fear that you, what you're proposing is going to suddenly wipe away centuries of skills and experience and thinking. And that's certainly not the case. I think that there's no risk of any of these things replacing traditional materials or traditional methods of fabrication. But there are some very exciting visions within this um, that could come to the fore in future decades. There are lots of ethical questions that are raised, clearly, but there are also some visions for sustainability that I think could be really useful. Um, the, the key as well is that it's not just about art artists and scientists having these debates amongst themselves. It's really key that there is public uh, engagement and, and approval for that kind of work because ultimately this is where it's going to reside. So this is hopefully a kind of brief snapshot that kind of introduces the day and tomorrow. Um, I know that the other speakers are really going to kind of flesh this out. So um, thank you very much for listening. I hope I didn't thank go over time. Thank you. Big hand.
what do you think about the role or the task of the designer uh, in, the, in this area? Can you briefly respond to that? Well, I think what's... Can you that one? Thanks, Anna. Um, for me, coming from a fashion background, um, th the notion that something ra as radical as, as having a garment which is kind of displaying real-time information that can be updated, that maybe you don't even have control over, is, is so completely radical. And like you say, I think some of these, you know, so many ideas that are proposed coming from a sort of wearable electronics direction fail to understand the real subtleties of cloth and how people dress and what role clothing has in our lives. And so to, to embrace something like that is such a huge shift. It demands so much of us um, in terms of that product suddenly becoming completely alien. And so I think there's a tendency on the tech side for ideas to be put forward which really have no, so they bear no relation to everyday realities. And I think that that's something that has perhaps in the past been missing from research is that the sort of basic kind of grounding and understanding about how and why people wear what they do. You have to sort of establish that before you can then begin to bring technology into it. Thank you. That's actually uh, some, some interesting point uh, to be kept in mind for our final debate uh, later on today, I guess. Um, as you might have noticed, we have a very tight schedule. So uh, I move over to our next guest. This is uh, Anne Galloway. Uh, Anne is a social researcher focusing on the intersection of technology, space, and culture. Uh, she's a lecturer as, uh, and as, as, as H R C, a doctoral fellow in anthropology and sociology at the Charlton uh, University in Ottawa in Canada. Uh, and is currently in the final stage uh, of completing her PhD on the social and cultural dimensions of mobility and the design of mobile and pervasive technologies. Her broader research interest lay in the increasingly blurring uh, boundaries between bodies and machines and between the digital and the physical. Anne's work has been presented to international audiences in technology, design, architecture, social and cultural studies, and has been published in academic journals and industry magazines and discussions in the popular press. So welcome, Anne. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? No? Yes? Is this good? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you very much for coming today. Um, I think I might be the only person on the roster today that doesn't actually make stuff. Uh, so this is, uh, this is interesting. Um, my, my materials are different. Uh, as an academic, I, I work with journals and with ideas and words and perhaps less tangible things. So I hope that you will bear with me and allow me a conceit or an extended metaphor that we can work with today. So I would like to speak about seams and scars. These are metaphors that we can work with and I'm going to present a bunch of little fragments to you and allow them to act as modules that you can then recombine as you see fit. So I'll draw them out for you and then we'll look at what we can make with them. So, seams and scars interest me in the first place because they are by definition hybrid objects and they are liminal spaces or spaces in between. So when we have a seam, we know that there are two pieces that have been sewn together. So we know that at some point something was cut apart and at another point it was put together. When we look at a scar, we also know that at some point the skin was cut open and at another point it sealed up again. So this sort of back and forth between cutting and joining, cutting and joining, is where we get a sense of hybridity. And this 
hybridity extends well beyond the material as well. So I started thinking about, well, is it the seam and the scar that is most interesting or how the seams and scars came to be? So a liminal space is a space that's generally referred to by anthropologists as something betwixt and between. The classical liminal space that people usually draw up is a beach. It is between the ocean and the land. But you can also have liminal spaces um, such as rites of passage, for example, from, becoming a, from going from a girl to becoming a woman or a boy becoming a man. Marriage is a rite of passage as well. You go from being single to being a married person. Um, these spaces, though, are spaces of becoming. They're spaces of uncertainty. And we have a very long tradition throughout all of human history of negotiating these spaces through ritual. And so I started thinking about what it means to practice seams and scars. They're interventions, first and foremost. They're actions. They're things that we do. But they're also temporal. Every time we see a seam or a scar, we know that sometime in the past, we made something or we became something else. So we either turned a piece of fabric or many pieces of fabric into a unified garment, or we take a body, a human body, flesh and machine, and join them together. So again, back to this sense of hybridity. But when we see the marks of those actions, of the actual making or the actual becoming, they remind us that we made a decision in the past, or a whole set of decisions usually. We took a bunch of actions. And when we look at them, we know that it was something that was done in the past, and therefore we can project into the future and know that we can do it again. So therefore, these spaces and objects are spaces of potential. They open up new possibilities. In that space, we can find both hope and terror. Potentials can go many different directions. So those are the basic reasons why I started thinking about seams and scars in the first place. So now I'd just like to back up a little bit and see what we can do with this. The notion of technological seams is something that I first came across doing my PhD research on ubiquitous computing. Mark Weiser was a researcher at Xerox Park in the US, and he talked about beautiful seams or seamful computing. So much pervasive computing discusses um, a preference for its seamlessness. And this is also something that comes up in electronic textiles often. Um, the idea of seams in technology, though, is a little bit different. Uh, they speak specifically about connections, gaps, overlays, and mismatches. So a really typical example of a seam in GPS technology, for example, is what's called a GPS shadow where the satellites don't align, where you can sort of get out of the space and there's, there's a gap where the technology doesn't work. And as it turns out, when people are using technologies, especially in playful circumstances, uh, they use these gaps or abilities to hide. They take advantage of the glitches themselves in the technology. And so most of the research in ubiquitous or pervasive computing focuses on taking advantage of what might normally and has historically tried to be designed out. This notion that a glitch in a technological system is to be avoided, usually at all costs. And instead, there are researchers now that are working very much on exploiting those glitches. Now, it becomes a little bit different if we take it beyond the technological realm because suddenly uh, a seam or a scar doesn't necessarily have to be a glitch. It, it's not necessarily a mistake. Even when you see a scar on the skin, you know that a wound was there once, but you also know that it healed. It did, in fact, stop being a glitch at a certain point. It became something more positive. And I started thinking about, well, there's not necessarily um, you know, equality amongst all hybrids. We talk sometimes as though hybrid technologies are, you know, they're a given, which I would tend to agree with, but it's not enough in my mind to stop there and say, well, we're all hybrid or everything is or can be hybrid. And I started thinking that 
well, we know that all hybrids aren't created equal. There are better and worse hybrids, and we actually have to decide what better and worse means. So in order to look at how hybrids are created, we can look at what is being brought together. Because depending on what is being brought together, you're bringing together different risks and different responsibilities, and then enters ethics and politics. So different combinations of different actions, different values, different interests, they create better and worse assemblages. This brought me to the point of using seams and scars as a critical tool. Now, one of the things that we talk about when we talk about hybrids, and especially in terms of hybrid technologies in biotech, is the idea that you have flesh and you have machine, and then you have a flesh machine. Now, when we have the flesh machine then, it becomes very difficult to tell, of course, where flesh starts and ends and where the machine starts and ends. And so the flesh machine itself, as a hybrid, becomes unified and it gets erased or somehow hidden or incorporated that there were differences that got built into there. It also becomes very difficult to tell how both flesh and machine are actually configured at the same time. So it's not that there was a flesh and a machine that existed beforehand, but rather in the process of creating a hybrid flesh machine, we get a new definition of what constitutes flesh and machine in the first place. So we have different individuals being formatted here. We have the unified individual, where it's difficult to see what came with it, and then we have all of its constituent parts. When we can't see where these erasures were made, when something that uh, is, is hybrid is actually presented as pure, and it seems kind of ironic to speak this way, but most hybrids are actually presented as a type of singularity, which has a sense of unity and purity that is almost contrary to the idea of hybridity in the first place. So if we can break it down a little bit and see what was being made, what individual components came in in the first place, then we can start to identify where change can occur. And of course, that's the point of critical intervention. So this brought me to general practices of modification and maintenance. Now this is something that gets expressed a lot in discussions of body modification, whether it be piercing or cosmetic surgery. Uh, maintenance is also something that comes up. Uh, it would include both of those things, but it also includes things like diet and exercise. The idea that what constitutes a body is constantly being brought into being and then maintained. If you're bringing something new into the world, and you want it to stay that way, there has to be processes in place that keep it that way. And those processes are never, ever neutral. So if we look at the process rather than the product, we can see how things are being modified, how they're being supported and stabilized, because they need to hold shape long enough to be able to act in the world. And so we're looking to the space where they're being shaped and reshaped. This brings me to material cultures. I was originally trained as an archaeologist, so I, I always go back to material culture. My first love was pre-Columbian textiles, and I spent a great deal of time looking at native Andean practices of textile manufacturing. Everything from animal husbandry, to spinning techniques, to um, how you dye the wool in the first place, uh, I did my field work in the high Andes where the, uh, the camelids, uh, they were usually llamas and alpacas, they were being herded. And it was more than just material. It was material culture. And so when I looked at the designs on this fabric, the idea that clothing is communicative, we all sort of take that for granted. We know that because we get dressed in the morning and we look at ourselves in the mirror and we allow ourselves to go outside looking a particular way. These are active choices that we make. Even if your choice is to not care, that is still an active choice. 
But ancient textiles have very, very complex patterns of communication. And so in some senses, I find it rather ironic that we focus on the idea that new textile technologies are allowing new forms of communication. The process of communication and the process of symbolic and material richness is very old. There's nothing new going on. And in fact, a great deal of the discourse that happens around these new technologies is very culture and history specific. Pretty much everything that Suzanne just talked to us about is very Western and very sort of normal. And it doesn't take into account the vast variety of cross-cultural experience and worldviews. And there becomes times when we, we need to appreciate these differences. Now, I'm going to take it back into the realm in which most of us are practicing, and then we'll go back out again. So whether we're working with new fiber technologies or tissue engineering, all of these players are coming into the field. There's military, there's art, there's government, there's academia, there's business, there's publics. Now, the question of public becomes particularly interesting because, and notice I actually put a little S on the end of that, there is no singular public that we can really talk about. So when we talk about public engagement in new technologies, we really need to be careful to distinguish what public we're talking about, who is constituting this public, and exactly what is it that they can accomplish. In Western societies in particular, uh, there's a long historical and philosophical tradition of extolling the virtues of public. Uh, this is always in tension, though, with a simultaneous valuation of individualism. So we have, in Western history and culture, a very peculiar sense of public, because a public is only ever a collection of individuals. And individual and collective ethics are not the same. So when we talk about privileging individualism at the same time as fostering publics, we create a tension that is very difficult to resolve. So when we're looking at each of these groups and each of these practices that comes together, we can look at them as cultural practices. What is it that they do? What are the values that they hold? What are the interests that they represent? How are they working? All of my interest is in process, although I've learned over the years that saying the word process with designers and artists is kind of a tricky thing because it, it means something different in different disciplines. And in my, my disciplines, process very much focuses on the sense of becoming. So rather than looking at something that already exists, we're interested in how it comes to be. Now, in order to understand the importance of that sort of difference, all we need to do is put it in the personal realm. Say, for example, you do something mean to someone else. You're cruel to someone. Now, if we look at that as sort of an essential quality, then you become a cruel person. If you look at it as something that you do, then you did a cruel thing. If you are a cruel person, it is very difficult to become an uncruel person. If you do a cruel thing, the very next thing you can do can be kind. It's much more flexible. So this place of becoming, or this act of always being in progress, is very important when we want to discuss public engagement, because it is constantly reconstituting itself. There is the idea that we can reform, form, reshape, always going through it. We're not done. So when it comes to ethics, um, they're, they're not something that we need to set out in stone. And this is where things can get interesting. So I started thinking about stitching together the ethical and the aesthetic. Uh, my own work deals a great uh, a great deal actually with ethics. And in sociology and anthropology, ethics take on a slightly different sense because we work with a concept called ethos, or the sort of worldview and, and set of understandings that any group of people come up with. These are the principles that guide us in our everyday lives. Every single person in this room has a personal ethos, which sometimes overlaps with a more collective ethos and sometimes not. Uh, but what this does is separate ethics from morality. If we think about morality as something that is decided from the top, like a set of rules, say the Ten Commandments, it is very top-down. Ethics as ethos, or practice and principle, is bottom-up. 
And that means that we're practicing it all the time. We're making it up according to the experiences and the contexts around us. And that, in fact, is always tied into the aesthetic. Because the aesthetic, in the sense of being interested in what is beautiful, what is beautiful is always a matter also of what is good. And so it becomes impossible to disengage them from each other. And so we have a sense of what might be called an ethical aesthetics or an aesthetical ethics. And either way, they just sort of become all messed up together. And it's how we negotiate everyday life. It's how we talk to each other. It's how we decide who are our friends. It's how we make decisions in management, uh, how we teach our students, how we do our work. These are very, very small scale local practices that I'm talking about. And we do, in fact, even if we're not sort of identifying them in terms of, of beauty and, and ugliness or pain and pleasure, this is always implicit in these actions. And we are making it up as we go along, and we agree it to it or not. So that brings me to the final sort of point that I wanted to make, because I started thinking about, well, how do we look then at stitching together these ethics, these politics, these aesthetics, what generally falls into what's called the social and the cultural. This is a space of value and a space of practice. These are things that we do. These are not the products that we produce. This is how we get to that point. So to step back and start asking what is being seamed together, how a scar comes to form, when two bodies collide, they crash, they become something else, all of that, we can ask what and whom are being made, not just at the end, but every step along the way. If we think about ethos as sort of a, an iterative ethics that we negotiate step by step, then this is the exact same process that we can use in evaluating our own practices. And this holds true for all of those domains that I just described. It doesn't matter whether it's military or academia or public, government, Everybody is making decisions. Like I said, very local, very small scale. We tend to think globally all the time. And there's a lot to be said for taking it right down into the small and taking responsibility for and being accountable to other practices and other interests that seem unrelated. One of the greatest challenges I believe that face uh, all of the people involved in, in making these decisions is in fact being accountable for and to interests that you think are irrelevant or are contradictory to your own. The greatest challenge perhaps in a sense of global citizenship, which will be that way of negotiating all of these collaborations, is how well can we work with difference? So when we think about, uh, back to the idea of seams, there can be a whole bunch of different fabrics. A quilt is a really nice way to look at it because you can, you can see quite visually that there's different p uh, patterns, different textures, and they get to sort of stay as they were in one sense. You cut out a piece of fabric and it gets to be that piece of fabric, and yet it gets layered on another piece of fabric. And so difference then is allowed to persist. It, it, it isn't crushed, it isn't squashed, it doesn't get blended together it becomes sort of beside each other, or on top of each other, or below each other. And of course, that again raises the question of ethics. Is this something that should be hierarchical? Is it something that should be more heterarchical or horizontal in its, uh, in its co collaboration and its form? So when we're doing our work, regardless of all of the intentions, all of the beautiful things that get put up, and we will see absolutely astounding things today. And my concern at this point is to start asking how this work is done. My dissertation was written entirely about how designers work. I did an ethnography of design. I wasn't interested so much in the actual technologies at the end. I wanted to know how they got made. I wanted to know what values were built into them. I wanted to know when people fought, when things didn't work, when collaboration failed, when there were tensions, and when those tensions or chafing became the more productive force. But this ability, again, back in the terms of ethics and, and politics, this ability to sort of leave difference well enough alone um, this is a challenge, especially in the, uh, um, 
sort of social democratic tradition. Canada and many Scandinavian countries, for example, have mandates, national mandates of multiculturalism. And these are difficult things to work with because we have institutions in place to help us negotiate difference. And we're at a stage in intellectual history that is still slightly relative. This is sort of the, the last vestiges of the postmodern mark on things. Uh, when I look at my students and ask them to take a stand, they can't because they're so respectful. They look at everybody and they go, oh, you know, that's great. That's your opinion and you're entitled to your opinion. And they've been trained very well in our multicultural tradition to not pass judgment. But I want to pass judgment. And it's because we do it all the time. We don't do it in front of each other. We sneak off into the hall after we, talk, we listen to somebody's uh, talk, and then we talk about it behind their back somehow. So it's not like we're not having these discussions. I just want to bring them right to the forefront. I want us to actually come out and say, you know, I think this is wrong, and this is why. I think that somebody should have to answer to a concern of mine, and that I should have to answer to a concern of yours that I don't share. More specifically, the more I disagree with you, the greater my obligation is to figure out a way of being with you. Because when it comes to trust, when it comes to collaboration, when it comes to doing things, we just have to live together and work together. And are we going to set up obstacles? Maybe. Some obstacle courses are really fun. Nothing wrong with that at all. But I would like to make these things really obvious because as soon as they're out, we have to face them. Rather than whispering about it behind everyone's back, rather than making you know, snide comments about people's work, which you know, we have all heard at every conference and class we have ever attended. Um, and in fact, if you come from cultural traditions that are based on politeness, that's exactly how it's done. Um, I'm not saying that we should be rude. I do believe in polite and civil discourse. But I do think that we should be able to and should want to ask each other hard questions and to have to answer them, even if it's an answer that we don't like. And so that's the idea that I'd like to leave everyone with today, is asking how your work is being done. Who and what are you making, including yourselves, including myself? When I get up here and talk, what kind of academic am I being? What kind of relationships am I trying to establish? And at the end of the day, what kind of person am I? And how does that relate to who you can be when you're with me? So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm just going to uh, come up with a brief question. Or Susan, do you have one? I'll do this one. Uh, you leave it for uh, the final debate then. Um, when uh, Toby will be uh, set up for his uh, presentation, I have a brief question for you, uh, Anne. Would it be appropriate to attach um, interaction as a, a keyword to your uh, lecture? Because for me, it's, that's the, the area where, where all things come together in terms of ethics aesthetics that's really intertwined in the whole process of interaction but also uh, I think it's uh, related to the problematics you outlined where uh, the, the art meets the business meets the military apparatus meets the the government etc etc it was a long one um, I, I think Exactly, that is the core of the problem because we, I think we, at least I, don't consider myself a representative of one single group. Yeah. Through interaction, you're becoming participant, audience, producer, and you probably have relations with academia, but also have uh, clear references to, uh, to business, et cetera, et cetera. Can you give us a little bit more hints in that direction? Uh, oh, actually, I mean, it's kind of funny that you say that because there, there is no social and cultural without interaction. We, you know, from the social perspective, you, you don't exist except for in relation to other people. 
So this boundary crossing, of course, uh, this idea of us and them, either being you know, a member of the military or the government or business, I, it's really not that simple because of course these people are people too. If nothing else, you know, we're, we're human beings at the end of the day. And so of course we have different interests. And this overlapping though is part of the mangle that's being created and part of our challenge to accept difference in ourselves as well as in each other. Okay, this is uh, food for thoughts. Uh, thank you uh, very much again. Toby, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. The project I'm going to talk about today is a collaboration with uh, Nikki Stott, who's uh, uh, traditionally a, a jeweler, a metal worker, and also Ian Thompson, who's a materials engineer um, at King's College London now. Uh, so we're based at, at Royal College of Art, as I say. Ian's at King's College London. And the funding structure for this project was the EPSRC in the UK, who are a science council. And again, leaning on for what, what Anne mentioned there, it's um, the aim of the project is to be a public engagement project. So it's not a, a kind of a pure science project, but rather something which discusses pure science or seeks to address pure science in a, in a public arena. So something which really was um, a start point for us uh, at kind of a postgraduate level, because this started off as an MA project, was this idea that technology or innovation or the way that things change at a research level, uh, how is that discussed and how can that be discussed differently? Um, so at, th at this stage we were thinking about typologies really, we were quite naive, um, but it seemed that there was this kind of medical discourse, this very kind of um, um, thing we were in awe with, some, something that was done to you. We were subjects of this kind of science discourse, if you like. And then on the other hand, you have this kind of like a, uh, the fiction side of things, or uh, the mass media, which sensationalize, or um, talk about things in absolutes. So we were trying to find or articulate a space which was somewhere in between here. So it was a kind of a fiction, or it worked with fictive elements, but it was also based in, in true science research. Um, and of course, Following on from those kind of initial thoughts about where we situated ourselves within this was the idea that we would work with or, or look at a particular innovation. Um, and that innovation, um, and you can see on the slide on the left there, it's a, it's a foam, it's, it's a scaffold. So it, it's actually a baked glass composite. It's treated in various ways, and what you get is a kind of a porous material. So this was Ian's innovation. This was the material that he was working with. And what you, what you do then is, is you seed that, uh, that structure with bone cells, with a, with a big broth of bone cells, and you, and you need quite a few. And then the bone cells will grow into and around that structure. Depending on the properties, it might dissolve and just leave a bone tissue, or it might stay there and stay in the body as an implant normally would. Because what we're talking about here is technology for implantation. If you have an injury or a cancer or something, um, this material, this innovation is dealing with uh, creating lumps of tissue which can then go back into the body to, to heal that damaged area. So this was kind of a point of inspiration for us. But what we were interested in um, as designers was thinking of this material as not something that was then re-implanted back into the body, but as a material that went into uh, a, the design of an artifact or of a, of a thing. How would that change the value of that thing? What, what would... Um, especially if you're talking about cells which are coming from people. I, if you're talking about making stuff from, from bits of people, how does that change the way that we use it and how we uh, behave around it or how we value that object? And there's nothing really uh, new here, as, you, as you'd expect. There's kind of stuff historically which links into this. So this slide here is just kind of a few images of um, remembrance jewelry where, where bits of, of people are added to that, to that thing. So this is kind of... Um, a lot of this stuff is obviously following death as a kind of a, as a remnant or a link to that person. Um, we were, of course, interested in thinking about the relationship between living people, because um, bone, of course, uh, is, a li is a living material. So how, how, would that, how would that kind of talk about, or, or how would that lead to a discussion of objects in a different way if the people were still alive? And of course, by this point, we were thinking about focusing in on um, the relationship between two people. And, and the object we decided would be would be a ring. So this is kind of the, pro the proposition as it stood um, a couple of years ago, and this was still a, when it was a postgraduate project, I guess. Um, 
the, the material which has kind of weathered quite badly and looks a bit like a mint <laughs> is at the top there. Um, then the idea is that obviously that's seeded with cells from a couple um, and then you get a, a big bit of bone, a piece of bone, which then comes out of the lab and it is kind of dead at that point um, or it is, it is killed at that point and then becomes a, a material which we use with silver, with traditional metals, golds, etc., to make a ring. And, and if the couple were to kind of swap these rings and they were to wear each other, as it were, on their fingers, you know, what would that be? What would that be like? Um, so about this time... About this time and before we uh, really knew what we were doing, um, it became uh, quite kind of popular online. It become, became popularised through um, forums and it quickly um, gathered a kind of momentum which we hadn't expected. And so at this time we were getting funding, we were going through the stages of kind of doing it for real as it were. And this, this stuff was kind of forced upon us, this kind of people wanting to, 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 to play a role in it or to, to participate. And it was quite overwhelming and, and, and it really it immediately enriched the sense of what we were doing because instead of us talking about idealised couples or schematising what we thought would be an interesting scenario, we very quickly had this very uh, personal and specific input from a whole range of people, you know, which was, which was fascinating. So we ended up working with, um, with four couples and those, the selection came about purely because of their age, um, because they needed to have some surgery done, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, and if, because they were based in the UK, because obviously at a practical level we wanted to spend a lot of time working with them and that would be difficult. Um, so the first couple here, uh, both from an engineering um, background and both fascinated by, by the process of, of being involved in the, in the science, as it were. Um, Trish and Linz were interested in, well, they've been looking for a long time for something which they could th give to each other, um, something which would represent their relationship in a, in a powerful way. So they felt that this was, this was perfect for them. So all the couples kind of come to it um, with different kind of motive, different idea about why they would like to undergo um, this kind of like set of processes. Um, Harriet and Matt were interested in um, the ethical ritual of giving bits of themselves rather than um, a gem or something. And I know that's kind of not really a clear-cut thing because we're, we're still using gold in the, in the object, which I'm not sure if that's necessarily ethically uh, any better than uh, mining jewels. But that was, their, that was their kind of like a motive behind it, this idea of, of the preciousness of, of giving a bit of each other to themselves. And then our final couple, couple were um, interested in the extremity of the process. So um, Michelle and Ashley had come through us to um, uh, Bizarre Magazine, which is like a body modification magazine. So for them it was about the brutality of the donation process, which was you know, quite interesting. And so again, going back to our initial naive uh, ideas about how this would happen, it was a brutal approach. We assumed that the way we would get these cells from the couple was uh, through a, a biopsy. And of course, uh, you can't just do that. You can't uh, <laughs> go in there. No matter, no matter how much the couple want to do it, um, this is a regulated situation, especially because we, we wanted, to, uh, we wanted to, to base or situate the research in uh, NHS, which is the UK sort of um, national health service. Um, we, we wanted to do that because it would keep it open and it would um, keep us more accountable. So rather than going to a cosmetic surgeon, which, which might have been easier for us to resolve um, at a kind of legislative level, we chose not to. So as a result of that, it, it became the longest part of the, pr of the project became mediating um, a situation where we could take these cells. How could we do this? and how could we um, do it ethically and legally. So it was going through various ethics committees, um, uh, talking about the scientific benefits of the research, because of course it would not only be about the public engagement element, but also what, what would the scientists, what would, what would the researchers get out of um, the process. And as a part of, um, as a part of that, uh, we had to create a protocol 
to just ensure that at every stage of between the couple saying, I want to give some sales, and us actually achieving that, that there was a series of checks to just make sure that everything, I guess this is to stop the NHS being um, sued for their liability. So, um, sorry if you can hear me drinking. <laughs> um, this is Harriet's, um, some, some images from Harriet's operation. So all the couples um, uh, were having their third molars taken out, which is the, you know, the, the, the back teeth, the wisdom teeth. And this was really the, 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 the best way, the most suitable way for us to get cells because as a, as a part of the wisdom tooth extraction, it's quite normal for you to have a bit of your jawbone removed. So the, the, the tooth itself was not important, but it was kind of a way of getting access to a small chip of, of jawbone. So Harriet is here with Ian, just signing the, the final um, consent forms, uh, her boyfriend Matt there, and Surgeon Louis and uh, technician are all ready uh, to, to help to help her on her way. And that's the kind of that's the size of of the of the chip that's um, being handled. Being handed now to, to Ian. So this is kind of like a, a live photo story of uh, that day. Um, that's immediately taken down to kind of like a cell biology environment. Um, and the sample there is, is broken up. So the first stage is to really just chop that chip up into as many different pieces as possible. And this is purely to increase surface area of the sample so that when it's put into um, uh, a fluid, um, I can't remember the name of it now. Yeah, it's like a culture medium. Um, there's in interesting things about what that medium is, but I, I haven't really got time to go into that. But of course, the more the, s the, the sample is uh, chopped up, the more cells can flow out of that, that initial sample. Um, then it's those cells which will, you will kind of go through a, a process of, of culturing. Um, so period of weeks, what you essentially have is, is the cells just in the medium. They're growing, they're growing. Then you can um, divide the sample. That's called a passage. And then you will have uh, two sets of sample. Then you can divide it again and again. Um, you have to be careful because cells will sometimes forget what they are. Um, so uh, the more you passage them, the more risk there is of, of, of the kind of the culture failing, as it were. At the point where you have a big kind of broth of, of, of cells, you have enough there to then put them onto the scaffold. Uh, we tried a number of different materials. Um, and this, I think, goes back to one of the, the, the problems with doing this kind of work is that, of course, it's quite, it is quite complex, and um, we had some of the materials would collapse or they wouldn't last long enough for the cells to grow. Um, we had infections as well, so after all, all, this, all the hell that the couples had been through to tell them that the cells had suddenly died, uh, but then luckily there's some frozen cells in the background, which I didn't realize, but it's standard practice to freeze down part of that uh, sample. Um, so this is kind of near where we still are at the moment, um, a year kind of, um, we shot the project. The, the, the project is overshot by a year, and this is the point we're at now, where um, the cells are growing on the on the scaffold. They continue to proliferate, um, and then they'll, depending on the hormones and the growth factors that are in the fluid, will have an impact on the behaviour of those cells as they grow. So what you can't see here yet, but what we're hoping will happen, is this kind of um, mineralisation of the cells where they at first form uh, little nodules visible to the eye and then uh, slowly they will uh, calcify and become harder, at which point we'll take them out. That's a, um, a scanning electron microscope image of a healthy cell on the scaffold. You can see little tendrils um, reaching out there to uh, make contact with a colony of other cells. So. What I think was a couple of things come out of it. Obviously, you start off with a very kind of idealistic and simple idea of what the project might be um, and how you'd like to see it played out. But then, of course, going back to Anne's idea of the process, of a, a, series kind of, a series of changes or of complexities um, as you try and play out that initial scenario or try and get to the end of the project, different things come to the, to the fore and different things become important. And one of the things that we didn't really understand was that by 
getting the ethical consent to do our project, our public engagement project, we, all work, we also create a situation where for the first time some of the, the PhD students at Guy's Hospital are using primary human cells because there's lots of different cells if you're, if you're interested in tissue culturing, there's lots of different cells you can use. Um, and what they usually are are immortalized cell lines, which more often than not means that they are effectively cancerous cells which behave differently, they, they won't turn off. So um, their behavioral characteristics are different than what you would expect if you wanted to, to work with proper human primary cells, as it were. So we, as, as a course of doing the project, um, it, it, was, it allowed uh, PhD students to work on these, th on, on these cells from, from our couples, which was, which was sort of interesting. Um, so the sample comes out of, of the culture. It's, we hope, a fully formed piece of bone. Um, and then there's a series of steps which are taken so that it can be combined effectively um, with the gold or with the metal, depending on what the couples want, because they all uh, are after different kinds of designs or different interplays between the materials. Um, so another interesting aspect for us was that one of the things that Nikki is using to, to make the casts that can then receive the bone is, of course, this uh, rapid prototyping technique. So we can create the model and then um, print it out. And usually, it will be printed in a, in, a, in a finer resolution than this. And then we can then make the cast for the goal. So hopefully, the bones will fit in uh, very um, accurately. But strangely enough, um, that was exactly the same process and exactly the same machinery um, that was being used um, in, in surgery by doctors to rehearse complex operations. So this chap here has come off his motorbike and lost the, uh, the orbital floor of one of his eye sockets, so his eye kind of sinks down. Um, so what they were doing was building an implant to go back in there. And so they scan the patient's head and then print out the skull so that when it comes to that critical moment when they're uh, putting the glass implant in, it will fit properly. Um, so it was interesting that as a, as a jeweler or as someone who's used to, to, to the jewelry process, Nikki can have quite specific conversations with um, a facial surgeon and they might ne never have met or never have discussed their process, the, the processes they use, but um, that was another kind of outcome, I guess, which was quite fascinating. So um, I kind of draw it uh, to a close here and I guess what I wanted to kind of finish with here was this idea of unexpected collaboration along the way. Um, obviously, going into this, we knew that it would be myself, uh, Nikki, and Ian. But then, of course, um, it became an, an issue on the internet, and that's how the couples became involved, and that challenged the project and pushed it in different directions. And then also, we would have um, all sorts of people wanting to comment on what, what we were doing or what they thought we were doing. And their interpretations then became an important part of the project uh, in itself. So this kind of like two, um, two extremes, really, of the sort of responses that we've had. Um, so the first one is really about the, 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 the product side of what we're doing, the commercialization of it. And of course, we, we're more interested in just doing the process. But so it was interesting to hear what someone um, would say about how, it, how they saw it as a service or, or, as, a, or as a product. And also a comment from um, Ian um, Brassington, who's, an, who's a medical ethicist. Um, and, and he's kind of played a role at events that we've done. And it's, it's been really fascinating to hear his side or his judgments about the project as well. And there's a URL there because I've just put these, uh, these slides online if you want to grab them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Toby. Um, it, was, it was a very nice and dense uh, presentation of quite a complex project. Um, I have some questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, you, uh, you worked here uh, for this uh, project with quite an army of uh, scientific and medical researchers. Um, and I'm really curious if and how that influenced your artistic uh, decision-making process. Yeah, um, I think uh, the first thing to say was that 
initially we had a very um, kind of cliched idea of what uh, medical workers or what science workers were like. So uh, going into the project, it was almost like stereotypes, my own idea of what they were doing. So it's been, it's been amazing to see um, the relationship change and my understanding at least of what they're doing, like trying to understand the processes and, and the way that they work. So that's been a really important part of it. Um, uh, the other thing, of course, is that it just going back to the culturing and bits like that, it's, it's a complex process. It's, it's interesting that things do fail and they often take a lot longer the, 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 than expected. So it's just kind of the, re the reality, I guess, it's a kind of a translation of this idealised scenario into something practical that's been a, an impact. I, I totally understand that, but what I missed in your story, not to be brutal, because I really think it, this is a, a great project, but you told us so little about the artistic decisions. What, what are you making? What do you want to make in terms of aesthetics? So when we refer to the presentation of Anne as well, ethics, aesthetics, now it, we have a lot of information about the, the material research, the ethics, but I have very little information about the aesthetics in your process. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, I guess I've become more obsessed or preoccupied with the process <laughs> of the project. Um, so I'm sorry if I've missed out on, on aspects of it. But I think, um, I think what, what you might be talking about is perhaps what the couples want to see in the ring, because of what course, yeah, this is, um, this is something which needs to be precious for them. So uh, in, in the way that uh, Nikki's talked about or worked up the relationship with the couple, and um, they've talked about designs, and of course, um, uh, one example is that, the, that the, the bone is like an insert on the, on the inside of the ring, so it's kind of like a, a secretive element to, to the object. Um, Trish and Linz are talking about a kind of a filigree design, which is kind of like a mesh looking through onto the bone, so it's kind of like a series of windows. Um, but this is kind of a quite nervous question for me to answer because uh, we haven't got to that stage yet, so for all the, for all the talking about um, doing the thing, it, it's been uh, really uh, uh, complex to pull apart, and we're at that point now um, where we're starting to, to make the final design, so hopefully the couples will like them. Okay. Yeah, I can have two questions. Susan, do you want to add something or ask? And then move to you. Well, I just think that that's a really interesting one that, that's come up right at the very end, actually, which is to do with the fact that an artist or designer being taken into this whole new world suddenly becomes so enthralled with it that actually you, that becomes the obsession and your own practice kind of gets pushed to one side and that's a given, you kind of understand that. Um, and it's something that's sort of added on at the end, perhaps. And I think it's really interesting that for you it's become so much about the process that's, that's more important. Um, and it's certainly something that's kind of, I, I feel myself in, in my work is that you sort of, oh, well, you know, we know we can make the object. I mean, designing it's the easy bit. But this, this whole new world that we've kind of led ourselves into is, is so much more fascinating. And so that gets pushed to one side, but it's certainly something that... Um, you know, how you then take that back into design and the fact that the people you're designing the object for are having a much bigger role. It's no longer you imposing something on them. They've become completely embedded in the process. So it's interesting to see how these rings actually are not just about Nikki as a jeweler, as a designer. It's very much about these people and the material that they've given from their bodies and what, you know, what they then want to see it you know, being translated into. Yeah, just I guess a quick uh, comment on that. We made um, early on. We made a decision that um, rather than try and show it as a finished uh, or a polished project, and uh, I think again this goes back to what something that Anne was saying about the process of erasure when you bring um, different discourses together. You make a set of decisions about how you then show that that finished artifact, um, and we, we we sort of consciously thought that we would try and show every 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 part of what we did, whether it was a problem or a difficulty. Um, 
and sometimes that kind of shifts to it looking like an obsessive sort of self-documentation of, of the steps that we've gone through. But we think it's fairer and perhaps interesting as well to show, to show everything and to show um, as much as what's going on as we can. Thank you. There was one question. I'll just hand over the microphone. Okay. Oh, hello. Um, I was just wondering about, um, it just, uh, goes on to the question that before was, that was mentioned before. Uh, in how far have you thought about, uh, from the start, in how far have you thought that uh, the product you're going to design, in how far is, um, are the cells that are used, are, um, um, uh, are they uh, going to have uh, their own life? Like, in how far are you going to design the product itself or let, you be, let the cells live their own life and if they fail, they fail? Uh, in how far are you, have you thought about this? Um, so I th maybe there's like two aspects there. One is like how the cells perform upon the material and, and how the, the outcome is influenced by the ma Okay, yeah, so um, at a practical level, the cells follow very closely the, the form of the scaffold. Um, and we use very kind of um, basic techniques to preform the scaffolds. They were like um, just by hand, kind of machined. Um, it'd be interesting to look at more sophisticated ways of making that initial shape. Um, sorry. I'm going to be very brutal, but uh, we have uh, a large audience online uh, listening to the stream, and I don't want them to miss your question. So you get the microphone back. <laughs> oh my God. Um, well, I was, yeah, I was wondering, have you already th uh, really thought out about in how far you're going into the process of designing instead of, instead of uh, 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 um, explaining it in, uh, in the way of processing and in, in what is possible about scaffolding, but in how far have you thought of it about it yourself? Like, I'm going uh, this far and not no further than this, in, by means of design, the design the ring. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I, I guess that's, um, that's not something I'm hugely involved in. I mean, this is, um, I can give you uh, Nikki's email and I guess you could work, talk more about that. Kind of. But it's, it's maybe it's a kind of uh, to the side of that, if the rings or the, if, if the cells fail, then we'll still be making the couple's rings, but with not bone. <laughs> uh, I can take uh, one or two more questions from the audience. One, two. Um, I was just wondering uh, why you call it a surgical operation when all that happens effectively is they get a wisdom tooth removed, which is not really called surgery normally. So you kind of color people's perception and make it sound maybe more dangerous or maybe more sort of like debatable than, yeah. you know, how many problems are there with getting a wisdom tooth removed? Um, I guess the, uh, it is surgery um, and, and it's described as surgery and the risks associated with that are uh, nerve damage and I think infection and uh, Harriet um, had some infection as a result of her operation. But I guess, Surgery is, is a kind of hangover from the initial way that we were thinking about it as being uh, as a result of biopsy. Um, so it's kind of, uh, it just emphasizes the, 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 the decision that the couples are making and I like to talk about the brutality of it because that's how we initially envisioned it. Hi, I was just wondering, um, Who's the copyright holder when you would mass produce this item? Yeah, I guess as a design project, we've um, kind of reformatted an existing um, set of processes and technologies. So in terms of the, the scaffold, um, the actual IP of the material is obviously owned by the, the hospital. Um, all, all we've done is kind of um, re represented, I guess, the implications of, of what that technology can do. So um, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting issue, but as designers, we, we see our role more as kind of like um, uh, represent, re representing it or, or telling a story about it. So yes, it's a medical, it's a medical um, innovation. Yeah. You could imagine that the person who's given the bone would be copyright holder as well. Okay, okay yeah. Well, it the would be a joint. 
Yeah, it's, um, the, the ethicist actually raised some interesting points about the ownership of the, of the object if the couple were to split up, because obviously um, they, they'll end up with each other's kind of um, um, material, so that's also kind of something that they need to think about. So, uh, Susan, do you still want to add something? I saw you whispering uh, something <laughs> to Toby. There you go. Swap oh, mic. swap microphones. Um, well, I, it, it just related back to the question that the lady asked over there and um, made me think about um, to what extent you allow the cells themselves to dictate the finished design and to what point does the, the designer interfere in that growth process and then shape that raw material so that it can get to the point where as an abstract object it bears no visual uh, relation to what it is as a material or to the person that it came from. It just becomes a decorative thing that doesn't necessarily tell its story. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, going back to that, I guess though we could have thought more closely about uh, the shape of the scaffold, which of course would influence uh, the, the form of, of the bone. Um, but as it was kind of just proof of concept, we, we always thought about it as, as being a band. But then what is likely to happen is that when that, um, that tissue is taken out and, and it is kind of sterilized and it becomes really just an inert, fixed, um, uh, dead matter again, uh, there'll be a certain amount of working and, and sculpting of, of, that, of that form so that its interaction with the, with the gold is interesting or, or suits what the couple want. Can I just add one thing, that there is um, a difference between growing tissue in two dimension and growing tissue in three dimension. Yeah. Because when you grow tissue cells out of the body context, actually uh, gravity works on cells, yeah. they do. So if you want to grow them in three dimension, you have to create um, microgravity condition for it to grow. And also you have then um, some kind of limit um, depending on the scaffold, on how it will grow, but yeah. there are always surprises. And um, also, you have to consider what cell, like they don't like very smooth and, and rough and smooth and um, um, s like slope distance. They they like something that they can actually attach to and grow to. Yeah. So it's more a, a collaborative effect, if you want to put it this way. Yeah. Yeah. The the, the difference between uh, two-dimensional structures and three-dimensional uh, tissues is is huge. So uh, skin's kind of uh, blends itself better to uh, tissue culture context. Um, the biggest problem that we've had with the bone tissue is that you, you can't grow a, a vascular system. Um, it's, very, it's a very simple material really. It's just it's not real bone because it, it doesn't have the veins and the vessels providing it with nutrients. So the, f the further you move away from the surface of, of, of the tissue, the, the more difficult it is to sustain uh, healthy cells. So that's another uh, problem we've experienced. Yeah. You can grow really big chunkies jewellery uh, yeah, hello. I also have a question. Do these cells uh, contain active DNA? Um, well, th I guess that they're cells, so they, they'll have a, a DNA base to it, but we're not, um, I just guess dealing with that, we're not dealing with, with stem cells. They're, they're, they are, they're, they're differentiated. The cells already know what they are. Um, I mentioned that they can forget what they are, is their kind of dividing yeah, that, that is exactly, I think, the uh, uh, more. That's, uh, I'll defer to. Uh, every <laughs> every cell has DNA, an active DNA, of course. Um, the problem is that um, we tend to think that the DNA actually determines the whole development, and this is a fallacy. What happens is that the DNA is actually influenced a lot by the cells, proteins, and the environment, etc. So the way the cell expresses itself within the body or through the development of the embryo is very different to the way the cell express it, uh, the DNA expresses itself in tissue culture out of the context of the body. One of the biggest challenges of um, tissue engineers is ac actually to create a um, condition of body outside of the body, to create a new kind of body. F so for example, they realize for, um, to grow blood vessels you need to have a pulse, and like the heart. 
but you have to create an artificial pulse in order to the cells to actually grow and align themselves, and you need to have a scaffold for that. But still, it's not a, I mean, the body is still the perfect system to the cell to grow in their, um, I guess, um, natural design. So when you grow it outside, it's different. Yeah, but, but, but still, the fact that it contains active DNA, which is of human origin in, in this case, um, makes it, of course, also from an ethical point of view, a very interesting experiment. Because yes. it, it might have mm. a very wide, uh, all kinds of, uh, uh, let's say, legal and ethical uh, um, implications mm. that go much beyond uh, this project only. So yes. I, I, um, in that like sense, it's a very interesting uh, pro project. Yeah. Because actually, the most dangerous tissue to work with is human tissue rather than animal tissue for humans. Because um, what happens is that cells grow in culture, they are stripped from their immune system. So if you work with your own cells outside of your body, there are many um, um, possibilities for it to actually mutate and become cancerous. Even just daylight is uh, harmful. And by um, the chances are very, very small. But if you have a cut or something, and those cells are reintroduced back into your body, your body still recognizes them as your own. However, they've changed, they've mutated, and that's a very risky business. Yeah. I would like to suggest to, uh, to end the, the little conversation here. Please join us for the demonstration of Tecla. Um, you have a mic, yeah, you have a headset. Um, please, please move around so everyone can see the, the pieces Tecla is showing. Okay, oh, so, sorry. So in the spirit of V2, um, this is going to be a practice embedded in theory presentation. Uh, and, oh, yes, you can follow along, you can follow along with me. <laughs> on the slides which are here. So I'm going to actually show you um, uh, two, I guess, prototypes, two works. One of them is called Exhale. And Exhale is a set of networked skirts that actually expresses and shares breath between the network. So a lot of the work that I've been interested in is based around um, the body or even the question of what is body. And uh, I work with... Um, physiological data and with uh, movement and touch are some of the things that I've explored in various ways. And the uh, Move Me pro project, which I'm, um, is again a prototype project we're working here at V2 with, involves these soft objects and an interface that actually has shifted from the material of uh, skirts to the material of um, soft objects, cushions, and is exploring this relationship between touch and expressivity. So, I have to stand behind this huge plinth. I can hardly see you. <laughs> um, so this idea of move me and movement, I sort of introduced that. Um, Anne asked the question, or posed the question, what is body? And it's actually something that I've really um, asked that question of myself uh, a lot. I have a background in performance practice in theater, a, as well as um, computing science. But I'm very interested in relationships between somatics and actually knowledge bases of the body. And another thing that was said this morning is cells forget who they are, and the culture fails. I thought that was really um, a wonderful statement in relationship to how we think of body. Because of course, cells are, at least from the point of view of somatics, cells are um, intelligent bodies as well. And they interrelate with one another. We think of our own bodies as sort of um, an autonomous being. And yet at the same time, a group of people such as the group in this room is also, you can think of that as a body. And so this actual, the question of where the skin of the body is and actually both the micro and macrocosmic level is something that I'm, I'm really interested in in my work. So 
and also something that was said, how to create the understanding of the body outside of the body. So this may be, this morning it was said in relationship to culture um, and cell cells growing, but um, uh, one of the other things that actually embeds the work is this notion of um, sensation and movement. So again from somatics, and this is a, uh, a quote from Masumi, but the, the, the body essentially does two things, and this is really based on the neurophysiology of the nervous system. It senses that stuff coming in, and it moves that stuff coming out. And this is not an exaggeration or, or an oversimplification. Actually, our spinal, our whole, our, our, um, uh, the sensory motor system, even thought is, thought is movement, for example, and perception is the relationship between the senses. So the threshold of our own perception is something that actually can be shifted in the body. And certainly somaticists work with it in time, and, and some of the work this morning with dealt with science also deals with this. And interestingly enough, it's only been really in the last, I would say, decade that some of these questions have moved from the woo-woo to actually the culturally, theoretically thinkable. Uh, if you look at writing from somatics, for example, it's actually done so much from an experiential level that viewed from another domain, it actually looks as if it lacks criticality. But its criticality is actually based on a pers specific perspective, which is from the inside out. And again, I think um, some of the comments Anne was making about, she didn't use the word domain, but it really is the fact that different domains may use English, but perception or the point of view that they come from is so different that it's almost unthinkable or unreadable from another perspective. And so these are some of the other things that I'm interested in, not the unreadability, but how to share some of that knowledge. And I actually attempt to do that through the work itself and through some of these explorations. So people who know me knows, know I could do this forever. So I'm, I, I'll, I'll just stop doing that part for a while. I'm gonna, just going to go through some of these slides. And, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit about what exhale is and how it works. So um, clothing, I'm really interested in this notion of interface and the interface through the body. And clothing, of course, is something that can interface through the body and become a hub as well as a display again. Uh, that was a comment from Anne this morning. And this notion of expressivity, revealing and concealing. So these are um, uh, whisper skirts that you see, or sorry, exhale skirts. Um, and this notion of device or devising. Device, as you probably are aware, is actually the, uh, an idea of a noun. It's a thing. And uh, an archaic definition of device is the act or power of devising. So that, that, actual, that notion of devising is actually a verb. So this place between the thing becoming and the thing being is something that we do through our bodies all the time. And, and breath is an, a physiological data is both um, expressive but it's also the form that that expression can be read by. So it really does function in this way as this both a verb and a noun in, in many ways. So um, this is the question of why would you be doing this? Well, the why of doing it is because, again, in some of these areas such as somatics, this is actually something that is explored from a bringing knowledge through the body. And that is always done through the, a direction to attention, like so your own attention to yourself or to others, etc., And that is actually neurophysiologically shifts things within our body space, within our knowing space. So a simple thing like breath. Um, I have volunteers and they said to me this morning, do we need to come earlier? Do you need to tell me how to do this? And I said, well, actually, it's fairly intuitive. All you have to do is breathe. Um, that, that's that's um, this idea of, you know, Breathing actually is something that we all know how to do. Why? Because our body does it. So I'm actually also interested in, and there's an incredible intelligence in breath. When the breath sort of um, is one way of defining state in the body. So that's why breath measurement is used in, um, in biofeedback, for example. So the idea of actual, uh, if you pay attention to your breath now just for a moment, like I know, I can tell because I'm wearing one of these things, but when I speak, I, I, I always get quite nervous when I do this sort of thing, so I hold my breath, and uh, the vibration actually almost stops. I didn't discover this actually until I was doing this kind of explanation with this the skirt on, with my breath sensor on, etc. cetera. But um, the, another thing about breath is that breath is actually also empathic. I, in other words, 
If you think of, well, for example, making love or uh, somebody dying or somebody giving birth, well, labor coaches actually use breath as a technique to connect. And the reason is it's highly informational. We unconsciously actually are able to um, link into the vitality of another human being through their breath. That is why when somebody is dying, quite often a person, if you're close to that person, you will unconsciously um, link to their breath in order, for example, to um, ritual, in, in the sort of ritual sense, to um, accompany them in their passage from life to death, for example or in birth, this whole relationship of death and the process. So this informational content, we actually unconsciously check vitality or life, the lifeness of a person through breath. And there's been many studies done around the empathic relationship between breath. So it's one of the reasons of using breath here. And so how do these things work? Okay. There's actually a breath sensor um, around the uh, chest because that's the best place to measure breath. <laughs> <laughs> if we put it around the hips, for example, we wouldn't get much breath going on there. Um, and this whole kind of system is, is, um, is a body area, what I, what I call a body area network, and other people call this body area networks as well, so that it's actually a network that lives on the body. So using Bluetooth technology, for example, we've taken, uh, Thought Technology has a ProComp device, so this thing on the side here is, is made by Thought Technology. You can see there's no wires between it and the rest of the skirt. And so the breath data, or quite frankly, any other data of the body, uh, can be sent via Bluetooth to a um, processing unit. Now, I'll just show these processing units here. I know they're not in the skirt right now. It doesn't matter because they're Bluetooth. So we, sh they can, we can be in proximity, and it's fine. Obviously, this is not a very small device. Um, we're porting this right now to these things, cell phones. Um, and the point really is that a, a processing device is, is actually can be held on the body in a very simple way. Um, in the project at V2, we're using actually gum sticks, which again is a small microcontroller. So the idea being that you can actually distribute input and output on the body itself. And the really neat thing about distributing input and output on the body is that this al allow. What's the point of doing this? You know, it's a lot of hardware develop to hardware development to actually test these things out. I'll actually give somebody my breath for a moment. Okay. This is one of our islands. So we have these input and output islands. The ProComp unit is an input island, and output islands um, here are vibration, and also the um, you can see the um, the, LED, the LED display here. And um, if I I'm going to pass this around, but please don't take my breath with you. Uh, when you leave, so you can just pass it around. But you'll just, ho if you can hold that for a moment, and you can just pass it around freely. You guys both have uh, the 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 vib the the um, vibrating units are are in the inside of the skirt, uh, close to the skin, because that's a place where you can actually sense the the um, movement of the vibration and the intensity of the breath. Again, this is a physical, um, a physical relationship between your own breath and the sense of that breath. What it does is it draws attention to the space of your body. But in these systems, you can also exchange breath. So you see that there is also an, there's an RFID tag here. And they have small fobs in their wrist, the wrist units. And I'll just show you one. And the idea is that you can actually exchange breath by actually coming into close proximity to somebody else. Um, and, y and all the skirts together allow you to network that. So part of, the, part of the research here is not just this relationship to breath, but the part of the research is also that um, the body area network allows you to actually play um, with um, a hardware architecture in which you can try different things out. So if you can really actually distribute, so if I can, oh, I don't have the other one on, but here's, this is sort of a decoupled um, body area network. You can actually play with various inputs and outputs on objects such as um, furniture, a pet. Um, you can actually create a distributed network simply by taking this off and, and giving it to various people. So again, this question of body and relationship and the relationship between data can be something that can be workshop. So one of the things that, um, 
that we do is actually try some of these out, things out in various ways to see what the relationship and what the knowledge space is when people actually play with this kind of thing. And um, it's very interesting. You know something, I'm actually, it's, it's really interesting. It's, it's difficult, <laughs> you know, with all this kind of thing, like, because you give presentations with a, with a computer and PowerPoint. It's so different using a PowerPoint presentation than it is actually using real people and uh, um, a real space. So it's neat to have the real space, though. Okay. Um, one of the other things about the skirts is that you can see that one of the things we work with in the process is um, see this, uh, the sewing inside. So each of these skirts has a story of its life. And that story of its life is, is from the kind of um, the beginning of the idea of the body area network through to playing with this in a space with fabric, through to working with the engineer and the um, seamstress and designers, you know, in a workshop situation. And this, so this, the, each of these skirts embeds or has a history of the story of its life in its in its kind of seams, so to speak. So um, you, really what you should do is come, c come close and actually take a look at this because um, I, I think that you, if you sort of um, look at the linings of the skirts and look at the, in the, um, the way in which they're constructed, they're actually made so that the, the story of this process and the story of the fabric, and uh, these are all natural fibers. And um, uh, alongside, uh, my sort of academic degrees. I have other certificates. And there are things like um, body talk, which is actually a process in which you look at chi or energy systems of the body to recognize how you can um, have the body parts speak to one another. And one of the other things that I've studied is something, um, uh, I've worked with a woman who does this particular kind of energy work in which you actually, again, shift systems of the body. They're all different ways of thinking of or naming the body itself. And these particular kind of forms give us different kind of information. So uh, I'm really interested in embedding a number of these kinds of forms into the process and into the exploration of actually making um, the outcome. And um, Oh yeah, uh, what I, what I want to do too is I want to pass around some of these things or at least look at them. Um, this is the, these are actually really big, th this RFID. You can get them much smaller now, but we're, you know, we work with a lot of component parts. So for example, we worked with the fidgets. It's a hardware system that enables you to build things. Because one of the things about prototyping is that you need to be able to construct um, the hardware and the software in a cycle that actually makes sense. So temporally, um, you know, a year cycle uh, is a kind of a cycle when you kind of produce something. But a hardware cycle is a lot longer cycle than a software cycle. And then a movement cycle is a lot shorter cycle than, a, than the software cycle. So you're actually dealing with these things that each of their own creative cycles has its own time frame. In order to change hardware, because it's, because it's hard, um, and, and actually because of the, the design of the electronics, et cetera, is a huge time commitment. And, and so part of this idea of actually creating a kind of a platform that's expandable, that you can actually try different things out in, and that you can shift the form, the ultimate form of how it fits into other soft objects. So fabric is a soft object. Our thoughts and kind of the ways that we think about forming things are, other, are also soft objects. They actually are more pliable. So a hardware technology where you can distribute uh, and network has a real ability to be able to um, allow you to, in, in a sense, play with things. So these are some of our fabric prototypes. And um, um, again, well, see, you know, I don't know how well you can see this, but um, th we, we've explored a lot this relationship to touch and taxels. And um, I'm going to let you, if you want to walk around, you want to show this. And I, I have to sort of catch up a little bit with the, my slides here because I want to go on to look at the, the Move Me work. If you just look at some of these images for a moment, they're, they're based on the design of um, this idea of distributed IO sensors. Some of the images of skirts, et cetera. T I have 10 minutes. Of, um, this notion of breath, I've talked about that. I'm going to go through all of these really quickly and move to um, 
move to this whole area of um, question of touch. Another thing which I've said, I guess I've sort of skirted around is this idea of exploring the aesthetics of the fabric. So you can see that they're hi these are highly aestheticized objects. And um, the way that we've been working with this is actually, again, with from this idea of bringing in some of these other physical forms of looking at energetic properties of the fabric. One of the things that we've done is looked at where, for example, where and how wires um, are placed in the body in order to support things like polarity of the body, et cetera. Um, that little, the one that she's got in her hand is actually the same as this image here. And this is a low resolution gestural touch interface. And this work actually um, has a bit of a history, and I'm going to look at that. I won't go th through some of these lovely quotes. Um, I've been interested in working with different kind of movement taxonomies, and lab and effort shape analysis is this wonderful uh, approach to looking at the quality of movement. So qualitative aspects of movement actually allow you to explore this transition space, this transition space of experience in the body. And uh, the work began by looking at um, parameter extraction based on touch. So if you touch something, there's pressure, time, size, and these taxels are quite, l when I say low resolution, it's because there's three of them and they're really large in their place, but the work actually initially started with this Tactex interface. This is actually um, an optical fiber array um, in, a gestural, in a gestural tablet, and uh, it had about 127 taxel points. And you can see here, oops, I, I went to the next thing, but um, it had quite high resolution in relationship to this, but we successfully were able to encode this whole aspect of the quality of touch. When you deal with movement qualities, they're actually really states in a sense, but they're, it's not the same as trying to define emotional states. So rather than try to reverse engineer emotional properties of the body, anything with quality always innately has an affect inside of it. So for example, a punch, people tend to associate something like anger with it, but that's really besides the point. In terms of sort of movement study, you don't actually look at what the assumed emotional aspect is, but you look at the quality. So a quality of light, for example, has a certain kind of sense of maybe almost meditativeness, you could say, or airiness, you could say. But again, those qualities are actually, from a movement point of view, are uh, um, really looking at aspects of movement. And those qualities always innately have this kind of a sensual feeling tone to them. And the feeling is not named. But the fact that you can actually recognize these qualities is something that actually um, gives you a whole rich aspect. So this video, I'm, I'm going to just get, get you. I know it's very funny because it's one of the... It's it's, it was the first, I'm going to get you guys to move. <laughs> so, just, sorry, it's, not, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. Okay. Um, I want to move. I want to move. You can, you can help me with this if you want, but I, ha I had to move over here where all the pillows are. So, um, so you, can see th you can see that image up there, the video. It actually really came from initial exploration that was really about how you can work with that with fabric and fabric and clothing, for example. And this is the place that we started this exploration of um, gestural analysis and actually qualities of touch. And the work that I've been doing um, with V2, and actually in the construction, uh, so for example, that first tactile array that we took that was based on these small foam core pieces, and actually really, this is, these are three switches now because they're really far apart. But if you place these together and you actually touch the surface, what you're really doing is you're actually creating um, this is one, one put into uh, a pillow, and then here's one embedded actually into this whole display. I'm just going to light it up here, and you can, wait a second. Oh, it's not. <laughs> Why is it not? It was this. This sign? Because it's not showing here. Sorry. Oh, oh, just oh, it's just delayed. Okay, oh, is that, that's really nice. See, that's what, this is what you'd call stubbornness, I'd say. So, I mean, I, I really love this. I love playing with this idea of these kind of um, qu 
qualities that are embedded in, in, within the technology itself. Because we, we have this kind of way of, it's this relationship of always having something service us, but it's actually really not about it servicing us, but us finding um, a, different kind of w a different kind of relational way of working with the substance of technology. I, I, it, I haven't had a chance to talk about this anymore because I, I, <laughs> I'm actually having this real amazing um, experience of actually trying to demo and speak coherently at the same time, which is more challenging than I thought, but uh, interesting nevertheless. But, um, you know, I if you can imagine c engineering and sensualizing at the same time, and when I talk about engineering, I'm talking about things like you know, the, the whole way in which a circuit is diagrammed, the whole shape of it, this kind of very particular way we have to speak about and understand it. This is part of this whole process of becoming as well. And to me, it's, it's like the shifts of methodology itself. If we actually can shift how the methodology of our processes of engineering and software engineering operate, we're actually really working on a different level of, of sort of creating. Another thing that happens is you just have to constantly prototype over and over again, because not all the prototypes match your experiential desires or your aesthetic relationships. But b back to some of the kind of explorations here. And um, uh, th there really is this process. So if you look at here, this has actually got one of these um, touchpads right inside the uh, pillow itself. And you should play with this. Come play with it. You can see that what's happening here is as I'm um, s touching or squeezing or moving my hand over different surfaces, there's various intensity levels. These can be translated to these effort qualities. For example, jab, caress, glide, knock, punch, jab. And uh, once these things are recognized, those things can be applied to various sorts of relationships between things. So what we have in this um, Move Me prototype, and there's a single one here, is a touch um, surface inside that is actually connected to, um, you can see this, uh, the an LED array, and right now what it's doing is actually responding in intensity and pattern to um, the various kinds of qualities of the touch. And there's also, you can listen to it very carefully, there's a, there's a small um, sound output as well, which again is mapped. So there was this relationship of exploring those mappings um, of, I, I mean, just, just for a moment, you know, I, I'm just having a moment of just like, thinking of myself here, I'm kneeling on a big red cushion. I'm holding this other thing up. I'm almost praying to it, and I'm talking to 100 people. Okay, this is not a normal presentation style. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, what's interesting to me, what's happening with me right now physically, is my state, because of the state I'm in, and I'm, I don't mean because I'm crouched down, maybe part of it is that, it, you know, inside me there's a softening happening not, and I can't even articulate it, and usually I can talk until the cows come home. But it's really interesting. I'm, I'm having these, all sh these shifts in me because I have to go between standing with this, you know, uh, you know, plinth. It's sticking right up. And then I've got these things here, and they're soft, and this, there's a real different re relational difference in how you process things and in how it actually um, is received both to me and to you. So I, I, I think these things in dealing with technology are really critical. And it's this, you know, lately I've been thinking about the space of the soft. Uh, because the soft, you know, we, we use the word soft in very many different ways. But soft sometimes means idiot. But so soft also means um, uh, re receptive. So there's this whole space of, um, of this relationship. And I know that um, Joey's lab, this notion of soft, it's soft circuits, for example. But there's, I it's, it's not just a, a pr an adjective that goes with a quality of, of, of flexibility. It's not, just, it's not just a descriptive adjective that means it's flexible, a flexible display, the way that you would see maybe, you know, um, uh, uh, France Check Telecom describe it. So it, it, it's Check actually the? more than that. I know I have to Sorry. stop. <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually, the quality actually is the transition, and the transition is the becoming. And that becoming is a different space of working. So um, really, you should t 
try this stuff out. <laughs> maybe, maybe what we could do is during the coffee yeah. break, people yeah. come and, and, and experience it for themselves and maybe... You that's know, a good idea. Have a kind of one-to-one -one I think that's you. a fabulous idea. So uh, I hope you found this interesting because um, I found it interesting. But um. <laughs> <laughs> Thank a, big a big hand for <laughs> Tecla Sripors <laughs> and her assistants. <laughs> I think I think this was probably one of the most challenging uh, <laughs> demonstrations for Tecla. I'm really happy. And 